welcome to the city. My name is Brandon. I'm one of the, the pastors here. And, and, you know, it's been about 20 years ago. We, my wife and I, Jennifer, we had spent some time in San Antonio at a church there, and we had just moved back to Lubbock. Our, our daughter was still a, just a baby. And it was late at night. It was around Christmas time. I was watching TV, and, and I saw something in my peripheral vision, you know, something kind of scurry along the ground, along the baseboard. And, um, you know, if there's one thing I hate in life more than anything, it's snakes. Okay, but a close second to snakes and just as terrifying as mice, okay? It's kind of ironic that snakes eat mice, so I, I like them for that, but I don't do mice. And I grew up on the farm in Leveland, like we had mice all the time, but you know, We've, I had some experience that kind of tra- traumatized me. When I was a kid, there was one that ran out of our pantry and ran across my mom's foot, and she screamed. And like, I, I still remember that like it was yesterday. My oldest sister woke up in the middle of the night with one in her hair. Okay, yes, that's that happened. And uh, mice are awful. And so there was no there was no question about it. Like I was not going to sleep this night until this mouse was dead problem was I didn't have any mouse traps. okay? So I had to improvise. Uh, so I went with a broom, and I was going to kill this, this mouse super dead. All right. Fast forward. It's a fiasco. I mean, the tree is knocked over in the floor, and I, I, I can't hit this thing. It's too quick. And finally, it stops under this pile of, like, Christmas lights. And I'm like, okay, how perfect is this? He can't even see it coming. He's going to get, like, stabbed by, like, 30 bulbs at one time. It's going to be perfect. And so I lay into it as hard as I could with this broom, right? I, you, you don't need that much force to kill a mouse. I don't know if you know this or not, but I was going to, again, it was going to pay for being in, in my, my house. And so I hit it as hard as I could, but I, I missed. I hit the top of the baseboard with this bottom of this broom, and I, I watched it run off. And then I noticed my, my hand was hurting. Okay, so what I didn't realize had happened in the, the whole fray is, the little, you know, I had an aluminum broom, the little cap had come off of the end of it. And this was the, the result. This is a, a current picture, but you see this horseshoe-shaped scar on my palm. I apologize for the, you know, sausage fingers, but that's just how God made me, so don't, don't judge me for that. I'm getting you to look here. The broom went into my hand. 13 stitches. $1,200. At the emergency room. When it comes to killing vile, disgusting rodents, passion and conviction without accuracy, it can lead you in a bad direction. All I basically did was passionately injure myself, right? So what do I do? My hand's wrapped up. The next day I go to Walmart. I'm looking for mousetraps. I don't know if you know this, but mousetraps aren't where you think they're going to be. They're in the groceries. I don't understand why that's the case. <laughs> That's where the mice hang out, I guess. I don't know. And so I had to ask this guy, where are the mousetraps? And he tells me, and he's like, what happened to your hand? And I, of course, say, trying to kill a mouse, which he thought was hilarious, right? But it was the truth. It was the truth. And what, so I, I buy a, a mousetrap for like, I don't know, three cents and took it home, and I instantly caught the mouse. Accuracy matters. It's not just about passion. Now, listen. When it comes to good theology and knowing the story of who God is, what he's like, what he's done for us, accuracy matters. Passion and conviction, it's just not enough. Accuracy is so very important. When you have passion and conviction without accuracy, when it comes to theology, it can lead you in a very, very bad direction. So we're going to talk about today, we're going to see kind of a new player in this this book of Acts, this early church story. A new player in this story is going to burst onto the scene. And just just to kind of recap where we've been, if you haven't been here in a few weeks, uh, we've been talking about Paul and his second missionary journey, right? He's just spent some time in Corinth. He met Aquila and Priscilla. That's a fun couple name, right? They're fellow tent makers with Paul, but they become friends and they're kind of partner with him in in the gospel. You have Paul, who the, you know, these, these Jews here were not uh, accepting of his message. So you remember what he did? He shook the dust off his feet. He said, your blood is on your own heads. Um, they, they, they have him arrested, basically. They, they beat him up. So his, his journey continues today. But we're, we're going we're gonna to take a little bit of a detour, right? Like kind of a pause, a timeout in Paul's story. And we're going to meet this new 
player in, in the story. And in the process, through Paul, through Aquila, Priscilla, through this, this other guy we're going to talk about, we get a clearer picture what it looks like to, to be a, a New Testament disciple. And like I, I prayed earlier, like we're going to hold ourselves up against the truth of Scripture and what we see there and kind of see for ourselves if, if we look the way we're supposed to look. So we're going to be in uh, Acts chapter 18. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there, verse 18. And uh, if not, you can follow along in our, our message notes on the app. I asked Gonzalo to come read for us. Would you guys stand just in the honor of reading God's Word? Good morning. My name is uh, Gonzalo Ramirez. I'm married to Jan Ramirez. We've been married for 46 years. In uh, 2021, uh, we attended the new member luncheon, and uh, that same week we started going to the uh, Barry and Elizabeth uh, Alvis uh, City Group. And then uh, a couple of weeks ago, we saw Roger and Diane come up and say they were going to start a new city group, and God just kind of led us to go. Uh, so we're now with... Uh, with Roger and Diane. And I would encourage you, if you're not in a city group, I would encourage you, you need, you need to find one. Um, just have great growth uh, in the city group. Chapter 18 of Acts, verse 18. Paul stayed in Corinth for some time after that, then said goodbye to the brothers and sisters and went to nearby Centria. There he shaved his head according to Jewish custom, marking the end of a vow. Then he set sail for Syria, taking Priscilla and Aquila with him. They stopped first at the port of Ephesus, where Paul left the others behind. While he was there, he went to the synagogues to reason with the Jews. They asked him to stay longer, but he declined. As he left, however, he said, I will come back later, God willing. Then he set sail for Ephesus. The next stop was at the port of Caesarea. From there, he went up and visited the church at Jerusalem and then went back to Antioch. After spending some time in Antioch, Paul went back through Galatia and Phrygia, visiting and strengthening all the members. Thank you, Gonzalo. You guys can have a seat. So... So Paul stays in Corinth sometime after, we've already see, seen in verse 11, he's, he stayed there 18 months, but he's staying there a few days longer than that. And he leaves Corinth and goes to, to uh, Centuria. So this, these, these are pretty close, these two little villages, these cities, about six and a half miles apart. Here's the map we've been kind of referencing. So here we are in the story. He's been in Corinth, he's moved down to Centuria, and then they're about to head to Ephesus and kind of finish, finish the journey. And um, so, so one... one Thing Luke adds here in verse 18. I don't know if you caught it, caught it there, but they, he talks about him cutting his hair, right? Paul cut his hair as, as a part of this, this vow before he left Centria. Now, this is probably a Nazarite vow from number six. If you want to study number six, go back and see what that's all about. You're more than welcome to do that. But the purpose of this Nazarite vow was to express a consecration to God. And it was almost like a fast. You know, he, he, he would promise to abstain from any products that, that came from a grapevine. It had to do with never coming uh, near a dead body. But then also, you wouldn't cut your hair for a very long time. I didn't know Mark was into Old Testament Nazarite vows, but apparently he is. Usually, this vow, though, is taken over a, a certain period of time, right? And when you finish it, you kind of mark it as completed by shaving your head. And then you would take that hair to the temple for this special ceremony where it would be, it would be burned, Kind of, kind of different, right? But it's about consecration. Could it be that this, this, this time in, in uh, Corinth, that he's had a difficult time, right? We've seen him covered, like just overcome with fear. We've seen him discouraged. It could be that, that this, um, this, this, the worldliness of Corinth has made him kind of double down. Like, like I'm in this for the long haul. Like he's kind of back to that can't stop, won't stop, kind of thing, a renewal of his, his calling, commitment to spread the gospel, whatever the cost, like he's all in. So what can we learn here, here from Paul? First, disciples are dedicated to the Lord. They're dedicated to the Lord. Paul's been set apart for, for a very specific purpose, right? He's dedicated his life to be obedient to it. 
He's, he's had a rough time, but man, he, he's, he's all in. In 2 Timothy, Paul writes to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, he says, if you keep yourself pure, you will be a special utensil for honorable use. Your life will be clean and you'll be ready for the master to use you for every good work. This is a, a promise here of God's blessing in our life and, and also our own usefulness to him in, in spreading the gospel in, in the kingdom of God if we live for him, if we set ourselves apart for his purposes, if, if we commit ourselves to a, a holy lifestyle, living for him, set apart. This is something that should be true for each and every Jesus follower in this life. We are called by Jesus himself to be in the world, but not what? Not of the world. We're supposed to be different somehow. We answer to a different power. We are subjects of the, the king of kings, right? We're supposed to be the light of the world, a city on a hill that can't be hidden. We serve the king of kings. Have you put yourself in a position to be used by God for his special purposes? Like, like how dedicated are you to his call on your life? to reach people for Jesus. So at this point, he's dedicated, right? He heads to Jerusalem to drop off his hair, you know? And then he launches out on his third missionary journey. So, so this, this third journey takes place in the mid-50s, mid-50s. And we're not talking about the mid-1950s for the Aggies in the room, okay? I apologize to some right over here. You're very smart. But not the rest of them. Uh, he revisits all the places, right? He, this is what he does. He, he goes back to all these little cities that he's been to before, and he encourages them. He disciples them. He encourages them to, to grow in their faith. But first, before, before he goes about doing all that, they set sail for Ephesus. Now remember, a couple of chapters ago, you might remember this, he wanted to go to Ephesus, but the Spirit of the Lord stopped him. You remember that? God wouldn't let him go into Ephesus for whatever reason, but now God has kind of given him that, the liberty to go there, the freedom to go and preach in this, this city. And guess what happens when he rolls into Ephesus? He does what he always does. He rolls up to the synagogue and he starts to preach. That's kind of what he did. He's reasoning with the Jews there, using scripture to, to point to the Messiah. But here's something that's not his usual experience. <laughs> they want to hear more. In fact, they ask him to, to stay longer. Like, how weird is that? Usually, they throw him out, they beat him up, they stone him, they have him arrested. But now, for whatever reason, in, in Ephesus, he's having great success. It's kind of easy, right? They're like, tell us more. And what, how does he respond to that? He's like, no, I'm good. No thanks. And he leaves. It's interesting, right? Like it had to be tempting for him to stay there where it was easy. He's had so much difficulty. Like I would think he's, he's due some kind of break, but God is leading him to leave that place. And he does. He, he says, I have to go, but I'm going to come back. And he uses this phrase, God willing. God willing. I, I love this. This is what James teaches us in chapter four when he talks about like, you know, we like to talk about our plans and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And he says, you should pump the brakes a little bit because it's God that's in control, right? He's the one that directs our steps. Like everything in our lives, we should be submitting to the will of God. So that's what he does here. He's like, I, I want to come back, but I have to go now. But God willing, I'll, I'll be back. And we, we're going to find out later. He does come back. This is what our lives should look like listening to God's voice and obeying it. Disciples, second thing we can learn from Paul here, disciples discern his voice. They discern his voice. Paul continues to be directed by the Holy Spirit to go where he's leading him to go. John, in John chapter 10, Jesus says, my, my sheep, they hear my voice, right? They know my voice. I know them. They, they follow me. And even in Jesus' own life and ministry, he says that he only goes where the Father directs him to go. He only says what the Father tells him to say. This is what our lives as disciples are supposed to be about. Lived in full obedience to God's word 
and to the direction of the Holy Spirit. It, this is the, the New Testament model. And my, my question for us today is, is this what's modeled in your life? Are you faithful to, to pray about decisions, big ones, small ones, whatever? Like, when was the last time that you stepped out and took a risk out of obedience to God? When was the last time you felt God was leading you to do something and you stepped out in faith and it, it made you uncomfortable? Is your life dedicated to doing only what God is leading you to do or you do, do you pretty much just do what you want to do? So, Paul leaves Ephesus, moves on to Caesarea, Caesarea, and he leaves Aquila and Priscilla behind. They stay in Ephesus. It seems like Paul had them stay there, right? He says, I'm going to move on, but I want you guys to stay here. This cool thing had started in Ephesus, right? People believing, and he left, it, he left his friends, Aquila and Priscilla, there to kind of take care of that work that had already started. In fact, we can learn from 1 Corinthians, like Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, that this church in Ephesus met in the home of Aquila and Priscilla. It's pretty cool. But Luke does, like as he often does, he takes a little bit of a side. He takes a break from the narrative to let us know something important. Um, you guys remember Dukes of Hazard? If, if you're younger than me, you probably don't, but... It was Dukes of Hazard, like how it would have this narrator that would kind of do these voiceovers. And at some point in the story, he would say, Meanwhile, back on the farm or whatever, right? <laughs> Uncle Jesse, who was fit to be tied or whatever, whatever he would say. <laughs> like, I used to play Dukes of Hazard growing up uh, without even have, uh, any kind of toy car, okay? I, we'd play Dukes of Hazard. I had a friend that had these twin beds that had like a high footboard, and we would like, Climb over it like we were getting into the front seat of the General Lee or whatever. Like, I mean, give me, whatever. I, I was like eight, and it was the 80s, okay? So we, we worked with what we had back in those days. Eight-year-olds these days are like basically writing code on their iPads. I, the kids, man, and their, their brains, they're out of control with this. I mean, be honest, parents in the room. There has been a time where your child has shown you how to use your phone or your computer or the TV or something, right? Yeah. I mean, eventually they're going to figure out that they're smarter than we are, and they're just going to take over everything. Like, I know I'm in third grade, mom and dad, but I'm smarter than you, and I'm the captain now, you know, they take over your life. It happens to all of us. Anyway, I don't know why I got into all that. So Luke does the same thing here, right? He says, meanwhile, back in Ephesus, he wants to tell us something important that's going to happen. A pivotal player is emerging here. He says, meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos an eloquent speaker who knew the scriptures well had arrived in Ephesus from Alexandria in Egypt. He had been taught the way of the Lord and he taught others about Jesus with an enthusiastic spirit and with accuracy. Okay, so here's Apollos. This is a big name. He's gonna, he's gonna resurface a lot of different times. Interesting here, he's from Alexandria. Alexandria was a city in Egypt. And for whatever reason, in these times, Alexandria was, was a place that was just safe for Jews. Like they could flee to this, this one city in Egypt to find kind of some refuge. And over the years, it got to be where their, their entire population was made up of about a third of Jewish people. Also interesting, Jesus probably spent some time there. If you remember when Jesus was a baby and Herod was trying to kill all the babies, an angel visits Joseph and tells him to flee to where? To Egypt. Most likely, they fled to Alexandria and stayed there till it was safe to return. So Aquila and Priscilla, they come across Apollos. You remember, I don't know if you remember, it's been a couple of months ago now, like I told you about Paul, like there existed like this physical description of what Paul looked like, remember? And it was true that he was a short, stocky, bow-legged, bald with a unibrow. That's real. Okay, so I came out, I came out with, uh, I came across one of, of Apollos, as well, and with the help of AI and an eight-year-old, I came up with this picture. <laughs> yeah, I, I bet you didn't know they were into America that much back then. Sorry, dad, dad jokes. Um, that's Apollos, no, not Apollo, Apollos. He knew the scriptures well. 
He was instructed in the way of the Lord. He knows about God and God's work of salvation. He knows that Jesus is the Messiah. He's just a regular guy that gains some knowledge, that rolls down to Ephesus and starts teaching people, using scriptures, trying to convert, convert uh, the Jews there. A perfect example from us. So we, we learned some stuff from Paul. What can we learn from, from Apollos? Disciples desire knowledge. Disciples desire knowledge. Like, he, he knew the scriptures well. Well, how did he get to know them well? He spent time with them. God said uh, through the prophet Hosea, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. They're perishing because they don't know me. They don't know my will. They don't know my ways. Knowledge is, is important. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, Paul tells, tells Timothy, work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed and who what? Correctly explains the word of truth. Like, be somebody that knows the word of God, that you know the answers. Like, you, you, you have not just, you know, uh, cr like when you cram for a test or something, like the, the way you gain knowledge is small investments of time over a long period of time. And slowly but surely, you're, you're adding knowledge of, this, of Scripture because you're spending time in it. And he, here's the truth we can't get around. Anyone can acquire knowledge. Everybody. And we should. If we're going to be faithful followers of Jesus who are, who are, again, set apart, right? We're dedicating our lives to be used in the kingdom of God. We have to know God's Word. And I'm just telling you, from my own experience, just the, the depth and the richness and the beauty of Scripture is mind-blowing. And so many Christians haven't seen that. They just gloss over things. They think it's boring. They'll search for little Scriptures here and there that just make them feel good for the day, if they even open their Bibles at all. I'm just telling you, we... we this is 11 verses I'm preaching today. And I start every, every time I'm preparing, it's like the biggest uh, ball of anxiety like rises up in me. And I'm like, what am I going to talk about for 40 minutes, you know? And then you get in to study the scripture and I'm like, what in the world am I going to leave out? Let me just show you. Th th these are, so we, we have like seven or eight different commentaries on, on the book of Acts, different theologians that are breaking all this stuff down, giving you all the context. And I go through all of them, and I pull out some, I highlight things, I, I do pull quotes, and I build this list of notes that I build my sermon from. This is, these are my notes, the stuff I did not put in the sermon for these 11 verses. I mean, it, it's, it's incredible, and it happens every single time. There's so much there if we just want to spend the time to get into it. But it's not only about knowledge. See, Apollos had knowledge, but he also had skill. He was skillful, like he was a good teacher. Disciples develop skill. Just like anyone can gain knowledge, anyone can, can develop a skill. Over time, how do you develop skills that you're not born with? You practice. Practice makes perfect, right? Especially when it comes to sharing the gospel or talking to people about Jesus or sharing your story with people. No one is born just good at that. Some people might be more natural with conversation or, or you know, char charisma or whatever, but no one's born good at it. It takes practice just like anything else. So many Christians are afraid to share the gospel, afraid to talk to people about Jesus, to share their story because they don't think they're good at it or they're nervous about it or they've had some kind of weird, bad experience where they got embarrassed or whatever. But, but listen, being, being bad at it, thinking you're bad at it, doesn't let you off the hook. Clayton talked about this last week, how, how we, we are watchmen on the wall, like we, we are witnesses. We're supposed to be telling people about Jesus and how us sharing Jesus with people, it's, it's not an if, right? It's, it's a command. It's a matter of obedience or disobedience. And he told us how you, you have to be bold and speak up when fear tells us to shut up. Followers of Jesus must preach the gospel. Pastors 
teachers. They, they exist to equip you, the church body, to do the work of the ministry. Are you practicing? Are you working at it? Are you trying to improve, just at talking about Jesus, getting more comfortable with it over time? Anybody can add, add a skill. My, my son, Xander, uh, he's 14. He loves golf all of a sudden, like the last year or two. Like he's obsessed with golf. Some of you in the room understand what I'm talking about. Like obsessed, right? It's a real problem sometimes for people. I love, I love golf. The problem is golf is super hard. It's, it's, it's extremely difficult. And Xander loves golf so much, but he's just starting. So is he like ready to go on tour, like be a professional? No, right? His, his love for the game kind of has outpaced his skill level because he still needs practice. So he goes out there and he hits bad shots. He gets real frustrated. And I have to tell him, listen, it's about working through this stuff, building up your skills. Practice makes perfect. You're, you're not going to be good at it right away. And maybe that's you when it comes to your faith. Like you love the gospel, you love Jesus, you love people, but you just don't have the skills to, to, to deliver that to them yet. And I'm asking you, have you been practicing? Apollos had been practicing. He's got knowledge, he's got skill, and this is key. Man, he had a fervency about him, right? A fire. Disciples display fervor. This guy was, was in fuego. He was fervent in the spirit, enthusiastic. Some translations even translate it this way. He was boiling in the spirit. Man, that's powerful. In Matthew chapter three, John the Baptist, he said, I baptize with water those who repent of their sins and turn to God. But someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I'm not worthy to even be his slave and carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The prophet Jeremiah says this, if I say I'll never mention the Lord or speak his name, his words burn in my heart like a fire. It's like a fire in my bones. I am worn out trying to hold it in. I can't do it. Can you relate to that? And if not, why not? Where is, is our passion as a church, our passion for the gospel and for scripture? Where's our hunger for God's word? Anyone can acquire knowledge. Anyone can develop skill. Anyone can be passionate. If it's something you believe in, you're passionate about something. You try to convert people somehow into something that you like to watch whatever you know, show or I don't know. I don't know what you're passionate about, but you convince people when you're passionate about something. Where's our passion for the gospel? Theologian Heath Fernando says this, but what a fervency. Is this a personality trait that only some have, which enables them to be good preachers? One's personality may be an asset to preaching, but it's not what lies at the heart of fervency. Fervency comes from a confidence in the truth and power of what we proclaim. This, of course, is ignited by the Holy Spirit. Such confidence is necessary on our part, and it comes through lingering with the word in trustful meditation, study, and obedience. Time. Small investments of time, over time, in God's word. I don't know if you guys were here last week for our, our baptism service, but the youth took over this room. You think our, our city youth have some fervor, some passion? They don't care how goofy they look when they're jumping around or whatever, you know? And I get it, you know, they're young, they're full of energy, we're all old and grumpy, you know? But where's our passion? You know, passion, though, isn't everything. Like we talked about before, passion and conviction, those are good things, but they're not enough. As good as Apollos was with his passion, his skill, his conviction, there was something missing. There was a problem. Verse 25, he had been taught the way of the Lord and taught others about Jesus. 
with an enthusiastic spirit, with accuracy. However, he knew only about John's baptism. So wait, I thought he was teaching with accuracy. Well, he was teaching accurately the things that he knew, but his knowledge was incomplete. He, he knew of water baptism that John the Baptist just talked about, but he knew nothing of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's like Clayton has said recently in messages, you can be as enthusiastic as you want to be, but if you're wrong, you're just enthusiastically wrong. So Priscilla and Aquila, they're like, dang, this guy's good, right? Like we, he could do something for the kingdom, but he's off a little bit. So what do they do in response to that? Verse 26. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him preaching boldly in the synagogue, they took him aside and explained the way of God even more accurately. Now, a little pause here. I don't know if you've noticed what's happened, but something subtle has changed throughout this chapter 18. Last week, verses 1 through 17, Clayton preached on him, and he talked about Aquila and Priscilla. Now, in verse 18, and here in verse 26, what does it say? Priscilla and Aquila. She's listed first. What's up with that? Here's what Craig Keener says about it. He says, name sequence can be important, especially when it diverges from the anticipated ancient norm of naming the husband first. Luke normally mentions uh, first the dominant member of the pair. The mention of Priscilla's name first suggests her primary role as Apollos' tutor. How cool is that? that? That this woman is playing a pivotal role in developing this, this young preacher of the gospel who's about to turn the world upside down. I mean, it's another example of women in ministry in the New Testament. As, as women, as Clayton said over and over, just flocked to the gospel. So they correct him. They pull him aside. And they're like, listen, you're, you're great. You're amazing. But... You're missing something. They cared about accuracy. Disciples deliver with accuracy. Accuracy matters. It's important. We must have right doctrine and sound theology. We read this verse a minute ago. We're going to read it again. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Paul says, work hard so you can pr present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the word of truth. There it is. Correctly explains it. He tells Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, keep a close watch on how you live and on your teaching. Stay true to what is right for the sake of your own salvation and the salvation of those who hear you. I mean, that sounds like it's, it's pretty dire, right? Kind of life and death. Like make sure you're teaching accurately for the sake of your salvation and theirs. Paul's gonna say in Acts 20, He's going to talk about, we use this phrase a lot, like I didn't just give you part of the word, but I gave you the full counsel of God's word. I didn't hold anything back. I want you to have a, a full, well-rounded understanding of God's word, all of it. And then he says this, guard yourselves against people that twist the truth to fit their own agendas. He says, watch out for that, like warning. And I'm just telling you, it happens all the time. Right doctrine matters. Context matters. Getting it right when it comes to theology is extremely, extremely important. Believers need to have a full understanding of the full counsel of God's word, or we can be led astray. We can be dragged into dangerous places. There are too many of us that get sucked into some preacher that's just real enthusiastic, and he says stuff that makes you go, ooh, that's good, or whatever, but his, his doctrine is off. And we can be led astray, yes, by popular preachers and teachers, evangelists, YouTube prophets. We, we, we tend to just, oh, he's a preacher? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just buy everything that he's saying, when some of it might be complete garbage. Have you heard of the, the brownie analogy? First service, love this. If you're going to eat some brownies, right, you got a whole pan full of brownies, but there's just a little bit of poo in there. Are you going to eat the brownies? No, you're not going to eat the brownies. If you do, you're disgusting, right? A little bit of poo ruins the whole thing. A little bit of, of wrong theology in someone's teaching, don't listen to them. 
Don't take anyone's word for it. Don't take our word for it. We say this all the time, like, be like the Bereans who a couple of chapters ago, what, they heard the message and they went back and compared it to the truth of Scripture to see, oh, this really is the truth. You can't just buy everything that you hear. You don't have to look very far to see people taking Scripture out of context, like misusing it. It happens. I see it almost every day, scrolling through Facebook. People having a favorite verse and just like just applying it to, to whatever they want. Like here's a, here's a good one. I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. Jeremiah twenty nine eleven. Oh yeah, y'all like that one, right? I know the plans I have for you to prosper, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. Man, that feels good. You hear the graduations, memes. It just feels awesome. But did you know? That the you, I, the plans I have for you there, the you there isn't you. He's actually talking to the children of Israel who have been banned. They're in exile as a punishment for their sin. And he's telling them there's, there's, there's a plan for you after this punishment. And the plans God is referring to are, are ultimately ones that lead and point to Jesus. That, that, that promise for a future and a hope was and is and will be fulfilled in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection and ultimate return. He's not saying you're going to prosper at work or you're going to be prosperous financially or you're going to be kept from harm and you're not going to suffer because if that's what he's saying, he broke his promise to Paul and every other martyr that Clayton talked about earlier. Philippians 4.13 is another one. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Love that. Makes me feel like I can do anything, right? If God's with me. Well, what we failed to realize is the, the verse previous, verse 12, Paul's talking about being content in every circumstance. So what's he saying there? I can do all things is referring directly to Paul enduring hardships as a result of living out his faith no matter the cost. A little different, right? Am I saying that God doesn't have plans for us? No, that's not what I'm saying. He obviously does. Am I saying that God can't strengthen us to do things? No, of course he can. But context matters. You know, we, we can't just cherry pick verses that make us feel nice and just run with it. Passion and conviction without accuracy, remember, leads us down a dangerous road. And Paul would tell us, like, warning, 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 warning. Watch out for that. This is why we teach the way we do, verse by verse. It takes time, right? I think we were in Luke for like 14 years or something, but we got through it. <laughs> but there's nothing better we could be doing with our time than digging into Scripture and pulling every drop of what we can out of it, applying it to our lives. It's important. I've grown more in the last three years than I have in the previous 42. Why? Spending time in God's word. You spend time in God's word, digging, studying, meditating, applying it to your life. Your life will change. It's living and breathing and active. And he, God says his, his word doesn't return void. Like it's going to produce a result but we just casually gloss over things and we, we give it no priority in our life. I'm guilty of it too. Apollos had knowledge and skill and fervency, accuracy now, but also he had humility. Disciples demonstrate humility. Apollos is learned, as learned people like to say. He, he's smart, smart, He's sharp, but he's still teachable. He could have very easily been offended. He didn't, he didn't know these people, right? Priscilla and Aquila come up to him, hey, you're missing something. He, he could have been offended by that, but he wasn't. It takes humility to be disciple. Notice what's happening here. You, you have a direct example of disciples who are making disciples right in front of our eyes. You have Paul who is discipling Aquila and Priscilla. Then he turns them loose. 
Now, they are discipling Apollos, whose ministry is going to lead to countless believers in Ephesus and across the region. It led to just a huge movement of God, and there's been humility all along the way. Paul displayed humility when he allowed Aquila and Priscilla to take over his work in Ephesus. Think about that. He had to step to the side and entrusted it to them. Aquila and Priscilla showed some humility in the fact that Paul asked them to stay and didn't want them to come with them. I might have been offended by that. And Apollos showing humility and being confronted for his error. And the kingdom of God reaped the reward. We have to be willing as disciples to be confronted and corrected when we get it wrong. But in order to to be confronted and corrected, you have to be in environments where you can be confronted and corrected. Gonzalo made a great pitch for city groups. That's what they're for. Do life with each other. He'll challenge each other to grow spiritually. Hold each other accountable. Who is, who is pouring into you? A believer that's more mature than you are, that's maybe older, may, maybe younger, but just more, more uh, further along in their faith. Like who, who are you intentionally seeking to pour into your life? And then on the other side, who are you pouring into? Disciples make disciples. There are no lone rangers in the kingdom of God. Verse 27, Apollos had been thinking about going to Ikea. Ikea. That's not how you say that. I wrote it down phonetically so I wouldn't mess it up and then I messed it up. Uh, Yeah, so, and the brothers and sisters in Ephesus encouraged him to go. They wrote to the believers at Ikea and asking them to welcome him. When he arrived there, he proved to be of great benefit to those who by God's grace had believed. He refuted the Jews with powerful arguments in public debate. Using the scriptures, he explained to them that Jesus was the Messiah. Like Apollos, his training here is complete. He's off and running, setting the world on fire from Paul to Aquila and Priscilla to Apollos the fire continues to spread and he leaves like a giant mark just on the pages of history so one takeaway very simple what does this boil down to what is it what what is the 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 book of Acts the, the, the first church these apostles and just believers and how they're living their lives what what does it model for us I think we can boil it down like this knowledge on fire Knowledge on fire. Not just knowing the word, but having a fire in you through the power of the Holy Spirit. We recite every week the City 7 core truths, right? But if you notice at the very beginning of our City Minute videos, Jacob usually goes through one of our City 7 core values. And he he did it today. Today is the second one. It's called Hearts and Minds. He read it to you. I want to read it again. Jesus said the greatest commandment was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It is our prayer that God will use everything we do to transform hearts and minds. We will love God with all our heart through prayer, worship, obedience, passion, and hope for the city to come. We will love God with our mind by reading, studying, discussing, meditating on his word. We will know why we believe what we believe through the weekly confession of the City 7 core truths. We will be a church, a people that love God with all of our hearts, souls, minds, and strength. There's no other way to love him. There's no other way to worship the God of the universe except with everything that we have. Where is your passion for the gospel? Where is your hunger for God's word? Can you truly say you're loving God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength? If Paul were to walk through these doors, short and bow-legged with the unibrow, 
I think he would ask us some similar questions. Like, how solid is your faith? Are you walking the walk? Are you a, a true disciple? Like, where's your hunger for God's word? Where's your passion for the gospel? I wanna kind of leave you with this verse from Ephesians. This is Paul's letter back to this church in Ephesus we've been talking about. Talking about spiritual maturity. Ephesians chapter four, verse 11, he says, now these are the gifts that Christ gave to the church. The apostles, prophets, evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to, like we said, equip God's people, you, to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue till we all come to such unity in our faith and what? Knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. You'll worship Him and love Him the way He, he deserves. But verse 14, then, what's the result? Then we will no longer be like immature children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. This is happening every day. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. That is the picture of a New Testament church. That is what God is calling us to do, not just as a church body, but as individuals. If you'll bow your heads with me, I just want to give us a moment of reflection and prayer. What's God saying to you? What's he want you to leave here with? Has your fire gone out? Are you in a rut? Do you, do you just long so much to, to be like Jeremiah, who's the word of God burned inside of him like a fire? Do you treat his word with apathy? Where's your hunger? There's some of you here that your fire hasn't gone out because it's never been lit. You've never begun a relationship with Jesus. I'm not talking about church attendance or some kind of intellectual acknowledgement that Jesus was the Son of God and that he died for your sins and all that. No, I'm talking about you turning from your sin, repenting, right, and turning to Jesus, making him Lord of your life. He's been pursuing you. And you... You don't have to work for it. You don't have to be good enough because you can't be. All you have to do is turn to him and take that free gift of salvation that he's offering you where, where he stood in your place, took upon himself your sin, your shame, and died, paid the penalty for your sin. He died and he rose again, and now he's offering you a chance at life, a guarantee of a hope of a future If you're deciding to follow Jesus today, I want to invite you to take that card in, in your seat back to the next step, uh, the Welcome Center, sorry. Talk to someone there. We'd love to pray with you. Talk about your relationship with Jesus. And for, for all of us, God, I, I just pray that if, what, what, are you, what are you speaking to us? Like if our fire has gone out, God, how do we, how do we fan that back into flames? What, what, what's a step that we can take to move in that direction? Not so we can earn your approval or earn your love or, or be good Christians or whatever, but because that's what you've called us to do, God. We are ambassadors of Christ. And what are we doing with that, God? What are we, what are we doing with the platform you've given us, the relationships that you've given us? God, set our hearts on fire where we can't help but tell people about you. We want to be useful, set aside for a special purpose. 
in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. We're gonna worship, and as we do, there's gonna be prayer team members at the front. If you wanna pray, want somebody to pray for you, could be something about the message, could be something unrelated. We would love to pray for you. So as we sing, feel free to come down. Would you guys stand as we worship?